Hi, everybody. Welcome to the BioXL web seminar series. Now our web seminar is number 42, and it will be about what is new in Gromax 2020. The presenter is Paul Bauer from the Royal Institute of Technology of Stockholm, Sweden. I'm Austin it. I'm Alessandra Villa, and I have two co-hosters, that is Julian Sint from Edinburgh and Ross Postel from, Stockholm, from uh, Royal Institute of Technology. So I, I want first to start to introduce the presenter of today, Paul. where he was actually working on enzyme catalysis with Lynn Kamerlin and there he would start also to get uh, familiarity and in, get involved in management of software. Then he moved to Stockholm and uh, as a researcher in the group of Eric Lindahl in Stockholm University and Royal Institute of Technology and, uh, and there, after a while, he took over the position of Develop Manager of the Gromax uh, software. And now he will tell us about what is new in Gromax 2020. Now I just, I just switched the presentation to Paul. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Alexandra, for the uh, kind introduction. And please don't be concerned that it's the show Alessandra is speaking because we're running all of this with her laptop. But this is so that you actually can understand what I'm saying during the presentation. I'm going to give you a hopefully brief but also informative overview about the recent changes to Gromax, 20, to Gromax that went into the 2020 release series. Uh, some of the new features we've added, changes we've done to functionality, features that got deprecated, and also a bit of overview of what we're planning to work on in the future. So for you, just a quick thing, what do we use Gromax for? Of course, we use it to do biomolecular simulation of things like membrane structures or complex structures of fatty acids that are shown here. Or the thing you would normally expect it to be used for simulating a bioprotein in aqueous environment. Here I show an example of a membrane protein uh, receptor embedded into a membrane bilayer with ions and small molecules surrounding it. With Gromax, uh, we have one good thing. We have extensive documentation and that also hasn't changed for the 2020 release. So basically everything I'm telling you about now you can read about in our release notes for the 2020 release and also browse our manual to see more, some more details for things that have changed. If you haven't watched them, I would also invite you to watch the previous uh, webinars for the Gromax 2019 and 2018 releases, so you get maybe an idea about how we have um, proceeded with changes over the last few years. So. With Gromax, we have a quite strict uh, release schedule where we plan to have one major release every year. And then over this year, over the uh, current year, several point releases to keep the software up to date and keep uh, bug fixes in the software so we don't let you use versions where we know that may, they may, contain, may cause issues in the future. Currently, there are two major supported branches of Gromax. One of them is the uh, 2020 branch that is for the current release. Here we do all our general bug fixes and uh, get fixes get in here first. We also still support the 2019 release of Gromax where there's going to be one more live support release. That will happen in about a month if we get the timing right. And no, less than a month, in a few weeks actually. And there we only do uh, critical fixes where we know that this, uh, the bugs that we find would uh, affect the validity of a simulation or that may cause major heartache for you if you want to set up a simulation. We may actually keep 2019 open for fixes a bit longer than usual and I will tell you about this in, about this in the future. In uh, the uh, fourth quarter of this year, we will start the work on the uh, 2021 version with the uh, with our beta cycle. Where we plan to do a few beta releases during October and November 
release candidate hopefully in December, and then the 2021 release will be in 2021 as it should. Also, just a bit of showing up maybe for the project. You can see that here of this plot of cumulative citations that Gomex is still relevant and still being used, and that also the uh, Hopefully it shows us that the newer versions are finally getting more citations and are more used than the older versions. And some of them are really old from 1996, the first, the first published release there. We are also planning on um, actually working on a new Gomex paper so that we can inform you also in this kind of way about the new development and also give a more up-to-date um, reference for you to use in the future. In Gomex, we have several projects going on all the time. This is a non-exhaustive overview of them. There are actually many, many more small projects, but we can't show all of them, otherwise this would be way too crowded. May, the main of them are BioSL, the European-funded uh, project that helps us work on software sustainability and general complete maintenance. The Swedish Software Engineering Institute that helps us to work on parallelization and HPC capabilities. Vendor co design where we work with hardware vendors to improve scaling and applicability of the code to different hardware, especially accelerators. And the collaboration with the National Institute of Health in the States, where we work on APIs and modularization of the simulator part. And I will tell about more about this in the future. But let's start with the main project that is the European HPC Center of Excellence BioXL, that hopefully brought you to the webinar. And here the software development is actually just one part of the work that is being done on promoting HPC software. It's also working on making it more usable for the development of workflows. We work for training and help providing user support. And also plan on being able to do software consultancy. Gomax is one of the major partners, but the other partners also should not be forgotten. This is Haddock, a general purpose docking software and the quantum mechanics engine CP2K that we want to integrate with the main molecular mechanics code to give a modernized QMMM interface in GOMAX. So now to the meat, what is new in GOMAX? This is basically a copy of our release notes with the major highlights. And the main thing that is new in GOMAX is that you can now use cryo and density maps, or in general, electron density maps, to guide simulations, meaning that you can use this to fit structures into prime densities or explore how the structure would move, need to move between one density and another. We also improved the uh, Python GMX API. We now at version 0.1, where we give a full functionality for all command language commands. So you can just run everything Gomex related now directly through Python and also included some more updates for the interface between Python and the core data structures in Gromix. A minor thing maybe for some people, but that I think something important is that we now give fuller support for the Chomfos fields, where we can now support virtual sites for two atoms in a line, something that had been kind of working before, but was not officially supported. But now we can actually fully support this and also can assure that it will, it will work as intended. Updates to the integrator also allowed us to improve the simulation capability a bit, meaning that you can now use accurate pressure compiling with the Parinello Raman um, scheme with velocity valet, something that again before was not possible, but now has been made possible. We also made a major improvement to performance. I'm going to spend a lot of time later on. This is the ability to run close to complete part of the simulation on the GPU using only GPU uh, using only the GPU device, and thus being able to accelerate the run the, uh, the run significantly. Another minor thing is that we uh, improved on the PME offload capabilities. So you may have known from the previous webinars that it was possible to do the part image yield calculations already on the GPU with NVIDIA with CUDA and NVIDIA, but we now improve this also so you can run this on general, with general OpenCL code on NVIDIA, on Intel and on AMD GPUs, so that we get closer to feature parity there. 
Now, main feature for this I want to quickly talk about, as before, as I proposed the landscape guided simulations. This has been the work of Christian Blau, one of the researchers at KTH. And he implemented a density fitting code that allows you to do accurate fitting of, of a structure and simulate the climbing density to experimental climbing densities if in relatively short time and in a physical correct sense, so that you can have phys physically correct behavior that is just guided by the forces provided from the difference between your actual experimental map and the map obtained from the simulation. And yeah. For example, how this would look like, you would have a um, general density map that can be anything. You put your protein next to it, and when running the code, you can make it fit inside there without much trouble. And you can also define which regions you are more interested in. You can use it for, for fitting only part of the molecule. You can fit in by using it for fitting small molecules or for in, uh, in interpolating between different structures. Something uh, has to be also said that we finally removed something from GOMAX that had been deprecated for several years now, and this is the group, group based uh, cutoff for particle particle interactions. Why I'm mentioning this here now for, and actually I have a full slide for this, is because this affects simulations and probably affects a lot of simulation setups at, at this point. If you have any simulation that used group based cutoffs, um, GPR has to be generated with MDP input files, they will no longer work. The functionality has been removed and it's not coming back because the valet based cutoff is easier for us to maintain, more accurate, and running a single, single code path and getting the same simulation behavior from all kinds of setups is, I think, preferable. The problem is that with the uh, with this change, a few uh, simulation setups have been uh, temporarily or permanently removed. And we hope that we actually get some of them back with the 2021 release. What this has been now, what is now being disabled is simulating under vacuum conditions. But this should be possible to be added soon again and is planned for 2021. We also no longer support user supplied cables for the short range interaction. This is um, also just because we need to update the uh, support for this in the, in the code base but we hope that it won't affect people too much. Uh, switch short change interactions that had been uh, only been able to use with the group-based cutoff have also been removed with PME because they are not physically correct and we don't want to promote this kind of usage. Uh, membrane embedding, so G-Membrane is currently deactivated, but will be activated again as soon as possible and will probably be re-implemented in terms of the uh, test particle insertion code. And currently the q memory support uh, has been removed because this also relied on the group scheme and needed to be reworked anyway with uh, a general look on the inter q memory interface. Another thing that had been uh, deprecated for a while and has been removed but is unrelated to group-based cutoffs is the generalized reaction field. We're working on more uh, specialized reaction field code at the moment and we'll support this fully later. We have some new requirements for the code and this is mainly that from GOMIX 2020, every compiler you want to use needs to support C++14. This is any reasonably modern compiler, um, CLANG 3.6, GCC 5.1, and ICC 19, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head. So that shouldn't be a big uh, issue for people. If you get uh, unfortunate enough to work on a supercomputer sy system where they don't support this kind of compilers, I would ask you to complain to the administration of your supercomputers, but we need this to actually make our code easier to maintain. Another minor change is that we need CMake with a version newer than 3.9.6. Again, that shouldn't affect many people because CMake is far ahead of this version right now. Again, this was needed so we can modernize some of our CMake code that had been difficult to maintain and should make life for everyone easier. Another thing that you may have seen if you are 
used to messing with source files or trying to build different Gromax versions with modifications. Gromax now checks if your version that you downloaded from this from our archive and built from the source files is the same as the one that we used to generate the source, source file. And you will get a warning during compilation and the build will be marked with a modification if you have man managed to change any of the source files. This is to help us to make sure that if you have an issue, we know it's in our code and not in any modified code. And also should encourage the people that distributed modernized um, modified versions of Linux, for example, with Plumet, to use uh, the ability to mark their version as a, mod as a changed version so that you always know what you're actually using. Uh, some more announcements just to warn people. If you're still using 32-bit architecture, Gromax will still run. It will, it will compile, it will run, but we cannot ensure that it will continue running in the future because we cannot support it anymore. We don't have the hardware for it. We removed one part of the free energy code for software power 48 that was not used by anything. So we removed it to, we deprecated it in 2020 and we removed it in 2021 to make all that easier. And we will also stop supporting on V7, again, because we have issues with uh, maintain, maintenance there with the compilers and it becomes difficult to test it on the hardware that we have here and so on. Now, enough with bioxel Excel related projects and deprecations. Now to some other things that are happening during the 20 release cycle. And that was one of the major co-design projects we had that was in a collaboration with NVIDIA to improve our GPU code performance and our GPU code paths and resulted in something like this in the stylized version. Before, in Gromax 2019, you had basically uh, two ways to run a simulation if you wanted to get um, good performance on strong, CP on strong GPUs with weak CPUs. That was offloading as much of the uh, simulation task to the GPU, meaning the non calculation, the mean calculation, and bonded calculation, and only performing integration and constraining of coordinates on the CPU. From Gromax 2020, this will be changed that you can do all of those calculations on the GPU, meaning that you will no longer have to perform copies of positions and forces between the device and the host, device being GPU, host being CPU, meaning you save time there, and also using the GPU to the, uh, for the update and constraint calculation, improving the scalability of the code. What this means like if you are someone interested in performance and coding and knows how to use the NVIDIA profiler, that what before was with the, the GPU power code in an update, having the update on the CPU and the rest of the calculation on the GPU, showing that you have a, a GPU path and the long CPU path that was wasting time on the GPU and leading to underutilization of your GPU devices. Now let's see that you have those H to D copy positions and so on. Those are the uh, copying of coordinate position and forces later from the CPU to the GPU and then back to the CPU and needed modification of them, but this is internal. Now, if you uh, change this, you can actually uh, perform all of those modifications instead of in the CPU on the GPU, again, making more utilization of GPU uh, kernels, reducing the CPU code by a bit, but not that much. But then you can make do all of this on the GPU, meaning that you perform integration with leapfrog algorithm, things constraining, separate constraining for water on the GPU, and then all the tasks as well on the GPU, and in all of the time you had wasted before on the CPU with the GPU idle is now properly utilized. Of course, you don't have always just code that can only run on the GPU. We have some cases where CPU, core, CPU, the CPU is still needed. 
And this is, for example, if you have special forces or special interaction types that are not supported in GPU code, for example, the CMAP calculation for charm. But that you can also use the time that you spend actually on the GPU or the CPU is idle to calculate those forces, copy them back, and then perform the rest of the calculation again on the GPU. Again, increasing the overlap between the two calculations, making sure the CPU is utilized the same as the GPU and the simulation performance. This is especially important if you think about more complex setups, like doing only part of the PME calculation on the GPU or doing the PME calculation completely on the CPU. Again, all of this is possible with different setups, but for now we want to make this more clear that you can use the standard code pad for the GPU and specialized code pads for different cases. Uh, all of this would be meaningless if I wouldn't be showing you some numbers as well for performance that were gathered by us for some very uh, biased cases I have to myself. Biased because we have, in all of those cases, very strong GPUs, a uh, lot of performance, relatively weak CPUs, and we also run only one calculation on each GPU. Of course, if you have strong, strong GPU, you may want to run multiple calculations on one GPU. This is possible, but the uh, performance cases become a bit more nuanced, so I won't go into detail of them. Just in general, what you can see, if you run the complete code on the GPU, in this case, look for the uh, dark green line. This is PME, non monitored buffer ops, and update on the GPU. You get about 30 to 50% performance improvement to the previous code path where you would only run the PME and non rendered calculations on the GPU with version 2019.3. That was the year uh, when the, those performance measurements were taken was the current version. Now, this holds true actually for both the uh, cases where you have no special forces on the GPU and where you have special forces in case of the Amber, Amber Force Field. And Sean Force Field, I'm sorry. Meaning that it means in general that we can improve performance a lot, even for relatively large systems, and even more so for small systems where you want to do throughput simulations. So let's go on. Other projects that we have, as I mentioned, was the project with the National Institute of Health. Here we're working on our API with um, Python, Python bindings and Daniel C API and also on simulation correctness and simulation setups. One thing, as I mentioned before, is that we are now at version 0.1 of the GMAX API, with complete support of all GMAX command line utilities and all, com all possible combination of commands. Also the ability to set up dependencies and workflows in the API that you can define inputs, simulation that run, and then the, the uh, analysis that should be done on, on the finished simulation, and the API will do the management of the resources for you. Uh, the work here is still ongoing because we need to, of course, improve the um, C++ API that is exposed to Python, and also improve the usability of GMAX API. Make sure that you, when you run you may say, and you're not just running a wrapper around all command line programs, you actually expose all of the data structure to the to the API level that where it should be. You also make it more versatile about what kind of input you provide. Another thing with the uh, NAH collaboration was that we developed a new way to do actually integration in, uh, in Gromax with a modular simulation approach, and this is just a sample showcase that shows how the uh, modular simulator is actually set up and how it runs its different steps. If you want to read more of this, I actually would highly invite you to read the documentation we have in the code for this and in our manual. They see different um, graphs also showing how the simulation will work, will work in this case. Basically, what the modular simulator is does is that you can decomp decompose um, one simulation step into the individual tasks that you want to do during those steps. So they are no longer bound by having a single description of what is 
supposed to be done during the simulation, but you can define that, for example, you want to do multiple bonded, inter bonded integrations before you do a normal step, easily making it possible to do multiple times the simulations. This also aimed at providing in the future, the ability to do something like Monte Carlo pressure coupling, because it will make it easier to save the uh, different states and uh, just decide between different paths that should be done during the simulation without just ending with a giant branch of if statements in the code to decide which branch is taken in the end. This also will make it sure that our code is modular as it should be, as the name of the simulator suggests. Because it means that we need to write all individual tasks that are done during a simulation step as modules that can be called and can be um, executed independently of the rest of the code. That is uh, one of the major challenges we have right now, disentangling different parts of the code. But we're working on this to make the core of code more maintainable and also more usable and make it possible for external contributors or people that want to implement their own integration algorithm that they haven't thought of to do this in this modular integration scheme instead of having to work themselves through our current <clears throat> main MD loop, MD loop and just hacking changes in there. This will make it easier to write their own module and this module then will do the integration step. We have a lot of long-term plans and observant people that compare this slide with the slide from the 2018 and 2019 webinars will see that a lot of them don't change, but that, that is because we have to work on them and they are not done within a few months or even years, but they take a long time to actually work out completely. One of the main things we have planned for Comics 2021 is that we have support for multiple time stepping. It will allow us to hopefully improve performance again by changing some way some calculation parts and also remove the uh, current virtual state setup that is not always physically correct and can lead to artifacts. We are still working on the modelization of programs, but we are getting closer there to actually finalizing this and having all core parts of programs modernized and modularized, making it possible to do easier plug like a base combination between the modules. The uh, lower encapsulation of lower levels and the API is something we also work in hand in hand. And we also work together in a different project called NBLIP that is working on providing a general API for non bonded calculation, a library that can be called by other programs as well, and that we want to incorporate as the non bonded calculation engine in Bromance itself. Something that has already partially happened with the work on the density fitting code by Christian is that we are having the ability now to do extensible force calculation with modules providing forces instead of again having to add force calculations in the middle of the MD loop. Instead, having an ability to add a new force calculation module or something, anything that provides force on atoms directly as part of the code. This will also hopefully be in the future exposed to the API, making it possible to write your own uh, port module and not having to worry about having to work, having to hack into the main code. Our projects involve also the modernization, modernization of our tool set that we are actively working on and that I'm myself involved in and the uh, hope that we soon be able to switch our current testing infrastructure and our distribution infrastructure to a more container-based setting, making it possible that people can just take a container we use, proper container that we use for testing, to test their own setup on their own hardware, and also make it easier for us to do investigation of debugging and for our testing performance in a way that is reproducible and not based on um, current systems that we have standing upon here in Stockholm. Something that is also very much in our mind for usability is that we want to change from our current legacy input and output formats to modern formats that are more in line with what people would expect. 
like Jason or YAML files that are used all, all over the place in different setups for inputs, and maybe also for outputs so that we can have a human readable file format that is easy to change and extensible. For example, if you want to change item information in a structure file, but it can also be used to efficiently and effectively set up a new simulation by re just reading it from this directly. Yeah, this brings me close to the end, and I think I am a bit early, but it means we have more time for questions. And yeah, I don't think I have got everyone on this slide, and again, this slide is old and probably needs updating at some point. And I want to thank all the current and past members of the Gromax team that helped develop the software and bring it to the point that it is now, and especially Mark, whom I took over the job from before, who has helped to actually steer the project to its current state. And before I come to the point where you can hopefully ask me all the questions that you want to, I just want to mention that we are currently as part of BioXL, and a survey about what you want in Gromax for doing QMM calculation, what major pinpoints now with the current, with current implementations, how we should change the code, and what we can do to make Gromax more usable for you. And with that, I will give over to the post now again, so we can go to the QA session. Thank you very much for that talk, Paul. Um, so we've got at least one question uh, from uh, Maximilian, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher your surname, but I believe Menger uh, is the first question. Uh, I will unmute Maximilian, and if Maximilian wants to ask their question, uh, their question, that would be grand. And if they are not there, I will ask the question for them. Uh, Maximilian. Yes. Would you like Hello. to ask your question to Paul? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you have also the Python API, and I uh, was curious, uh, do you also plan to support single point calculations so that you can simply say, I want energy and forces computed uh, using that API? Um, um, this is something we would like to expose and we're working on exposing. The thing is you can already, of course, do it by just doing a zero step calculation. But you sure. want to make this easy so you don't need to go through the uh, points of having to set up NDP plus and so on for this. But this okay. is something we want to expose. Okay, thanks. Cool. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Matthias Machado who, uh, unfortunately, their microphone is not working at the moment, so I will ask the question on their behalf. And the question is, is it possible to use cryo-EM guided molecular dynamic simulations to improve packing of lipids in protein membrane complexes? Oh, this is a difficult question. I think <laughs> it should be possible if you have a good density for your lipids that you can fit them in there. If you have the lipids as one group in your simulation in your, as an index group, it should be possible to use the cryo-EM code also to uh, fit them into the density you have for that. But for this, I would uh, recommend that you actually ask a question on the user mailing list, because then I think Christian will be able to answer you more precisely. Cool. Thank you very much. The next question we have is from... Um, is from Arthur uh, Zalewski. Uh, Arthur, I've unmuted your microphone if you would like to ask your question. Hey, hi Paul. Uh, so I wonder what is the reason for the exchange of MIMIC API, which was recently introduced into the upstream code, in favor of the USCPTK QMMM API? What, what's the reason for the, the change? Uh, they have to say this is more uh, on the management level. That we, uh, we are still working with the MIMIC people to support the current API. But uh, we wanted to extend it because we think that CP2K will be more, will support more kinds of calculations that users want to do. 
but this is more on the management level and less on the code level. Okay, thanks. The next question we have is from uh, Gabriel de la Hora. Um, I will unmute their microphone. Uh, Gabriel, if you would like to ask your question. Thank you. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, so uh, we currently are attached to the previous version, 2019.4, because we use Bluemit patching. Uh, essentially, I've seen that in your new slide that was a great improvement on the performance uh, because of the more use of the GPU. How would be the co the, the best configuration to install? On, on installation and scripting to use less CPU and more GPU. So from my, I also have the text of your question here. In general, you can use, for example, in your setup, something like four cores per GPU and specifying which GPU device you want to use. But uh, I have to give a warning because I don't think that the uh, current code, the GPU code type will work with the Bloomer patch. I'm pretty sure it won't work because Bloomer changes some of the uh, calculations and I'm not sure if it would interact with the way we do the special force calculations. That it would get the correct um, coordinates from the GPU while doing the calculation. But I can ask this. Uh, yeah. I can ask the GPU programmers we have if there are any issues with that. But in general, for your node setup, you could use something like yeah, each GPU is 40 cores. And just as I said, maybe uh, four cores per GPU and then running one, sim one simulation on each GPU. So that you have each simulation taking one, sim each GPU taking one simulation in the end. Thank you. Cool. Our next question is from Sahin Khan Al Paslan. Uh, I have unmuted your microphone, Sahin, if you would like to ask your question. Uh, Sahin, can you hear us? Uh, Sahin is possibly not there, so I will ask the question on their behalf. And the question is Can we simulate and compute, uh, run computations of metallic compounds and crystallic systems? Uh, the problem is if you have metallic compounds that they're very badly described by uh, general molecular dynamics force fields. It is possible to do uh, calculations with them, I think, in lamps and with special force field descriptions. But in general, GOMAX is not good at running metallic compounds because force field, general molecular dynamics force fields are bad at describing metallic compounds. For crystallic systems, it, it all depends if you have a proper description of your system in, a force, in terms of a force field. If you have a force field description that can be done in terms of electrostatics and van der Waals, and the force field is good enough that uh, you can get physical behavior, then Gormax will be able to run it. Cool. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, our next question is from uh, Aniket Magarkar. Uh, Aniket, uh, I've unmuted your microphone. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, oh yes, we can. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. My question is, uh, will there be a future support for PME uh, on GPU for the free energy-based calculation where you have charge perturbations? Uh, yes, those changes are getting currently merged for the 2021 release. Okay, so, so till the end of the year? Yes, beginning of next year, you will be able to do this with comments. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Great. Uh, at the moment, we do not have... Uh, that, that is all of the questions. If anyone would like to ask any more questions, please do so now or indicate that you would like to do so now. Uh, probably the easiest way to indicate is I will put everyone's hands down. And if you raise your hand, 
I will wait for you to ask your questions. That doesn't seem to be anyone asking questions. So in that case, thank you again, Paul, for the very good talk. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, further webinars uh, at the end of March. We are in contact with uh, Brenda Vallet uh, to give a talk about uh, PDB. And we've got other initiatives uh, going at the moment, including at the moment we are, BioXL is running a QMMM survey. Uh, you can find out more about all of the other activities that BioXL does by going to bioxl.eu.